Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, uh, as you gathered, this talk is about knots, and uh, and and how they're related to various things in science, which is remarkable, as you'll see, and uh, and it's also um, remarkable that you get as much as you do just mathematically out of out of such a simple consideration. And the consideration, as you know, is uh, is this phenomenon of, uh, of, of having a knot on a rope or having uh, two things that are linked with one another, which is the simplest example of that. But also, if you, um, if you put a loop in a rope and, um, and then you put the rope through that loop and pull it up tight, you get a knot, right? Or do you? Um, but, um, but in fact, uh, what I was doing there was illustrating how you don't necessarily get a knot when you drop a loop through a loop. Um, you need to drop it through the loop in the right way, and then you will get a knot. And if you drop it, pardon me for uh, um, it's a bad form to explain a trick, but you know, um, if you drop it through in the wrong way, uh, I've concealed what it looks like over here near my thumb, but I really did drop it through the wrong way, and so there isn't any knot at all, right? So there are two choices that you have. You make a loop, and then you bring it through one way, and you end up getting a knot, and you bring it through the other way, and you end up getting nothing, topologically. It's mysterious if you start to think about it. How do you know that you're going to get a knot one way and not the other? Um, how do you know that this one that I made correctly, now I'm getting confused about which one is correct, but the one that I made correctly uh, really is not it. How do you know that this won't go away by some other strange manipulation other than, uh, other than uh, the fact that I let my hands go? This doesn't go away. On the other hand, uh, if I start uh, making more complex uh, uh, tyings, like here, I've made a truffle knot, perfectly good knot, and then I make a square knot above it, like that. Uh, and this is still knotted. Everybody has experienced a square knot, and I'm sure you agree that this is going to stay knotted. And, uh, and in fact, this is still knotted. And then I do one more thing, and maybe this seems a little dicey to you. I mean, is it going to be knotted or not if I push this through here? Um, but it's hard to tell, right? I mean. Uh, who, unless, who among us, unless they had experienced this carefully before, would be able to predict by, by eye whether this configuration in f hanging in front of you is knotted or not, but we can do the experiment and we find out that it isn't. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so that means that, that, means that uh, there's, a, there's a whole range of experiments that you can do that are very interesting uh, even if you weren't a magician. If you're a magician, of course, you would do a lot of experiments of this kind to find out whether you could uh, make some, uh, some demonstrations that would be of interest to, to your audience. For example, another variant of that same magician's trick is to put a, loop, uh, put a ring on the knot, on the, on the rope, and, um, and then go through uh, exactly what I just did, square knot, and I hope you can see this. I have a movie of it down the pike in there, but uh, I thought I would give a try at actually just doing it. So here's the square knot, and here's this ring. Now, if I go through what I did before and this became unknotted, the ring would still be there unless I did something with the ring. So I'm going to do this with the ring. Now, now that seems like a perfectly reasonable thing to do if you, if you follow... If you follow what ha threading, um, I'm walking up through the rope, and it goes around, does something, and comes back down through the ring, right? Comes back down through the ring, so so that if you weren't thinking too hard about what it looked like, it would look like this, right? Uh, that you would have something. Whoop! There, uh, it goes through the ring and comes back through the ring, right? And at that stage, if I, if I put a little pressure on this, the ring will fall off. Right. Now, that's not very exciting, but maybe we can get the ring to fall off here, having prepared it that way. So, so now I'm going to go through the rest of it, which made this unknotted, 
but I have to choose to do something right, and I won't try to tell you why one thing is right and the other isn't, and let's hope that I did it the way I had in mind. Now, again, uh, you, you can't even tell that it's unknotted, except you, if you looked closely, it is what I did before, so it must be unknotted. And then the ring is there, and is the ring going to fall off or not? Uh, maybe you could hold the end of this so nobody believes that we're doing something untoward. But I think you see that it came off. <laughs> okay. So, <coughs> so, so those are those are some of the some of the things that are recreational about knots that are really closely related to the questions involved. Um, I can tie a knot like the one I just had, the trefoil knot, but I could also tie many other knots. For example, the next simplest knot is the figure eight knot, uh, so-called because it looks like a figure eight. And again, this one won't go away. There's no way to make that go away. But furthermore, there's no way to make it transform um, to this one, the trefoil knot. So these are two distinct entities, entirely different, like two different prime numbers. Um, you can't change three to five, and you can't change this guy to that guy. Um, and, um, and, and, uh, and we would like uh, uh, to have a beautiful classification of all the knots, but we don't. Um, we have a, a lot of information about the knots, um, and I'll be telling you about some ways of getting information about knots, but we don't have a perfect crystalline classification of all knots that would allow me to take some huge complicated knot and put it into a mathematical machine and it would tell me exactly what knot it was and not any other and so on. That's not completely classified. There are infinitely many of them, um, but that doesn't stop us from trying to classify and, uh, and that leads to the mathematical problem. Uh, now, um, digressing in the direction of the slide, we have this entity here, which is a drawing of M.C. Escher. I'm sure you're familiar with M.C. Escher. Um, and uh, Escher's drawing, Escher's drawing <coughs> um, is a drawing of a band with three twists in it, yes. Uh, but then he's made a cut all the way down through the center of the band. And he's made some other cuts. The other cuts are a favorite of M.C. Escher's, Escher's. They are little flat world entities, planaria, he called them, I think. Um, they're like planaria, and they are conscious beings. And he has three of these conscious beings connected to one another, or more maybe, uh, uh, to form the, the cut Mobius band. The, the, it is a Mobius band with three half twists, meaning it has one side. But the interesting thing is that after having made the cut, it's a knot. And you see the knot if you're willing to look. You see, it goes under, and then it goes over, and then it goes under, and then it goes over, and then it goes under again. And it's that trefoil knot again. So he was playing with all those <coughs> not theoretic themes in, uh, in that work. Um, now, as I said, this is a good illustration of, of the problem is this uh, just another one for you to contemplate? Is this knotted or not? That's a t think of it as a tube in space that's flexible. And can you make it go away? Is that an uh, end? I'm sorry? Is that an end? It's a right. An end? No, no, let me trace it for you in case something looked confusing. I'm walking along it, and then it goes back this way and around, like that, and then like that. Well, uh, it isn't knotted, and I'm going to illustrate for you how such a thing might come into being, all right? <coughs> so this is a piece of kind of metallic rope that a friend of mine gave me for Christmas a year ago, and it's certainly unknotted. And I, but it has a nice flexibility, and I can make things out of it. So I twist it like this, and then I twist it around itself like this, let's say, right? Um, and then, just for good measure, 
I take this and I twist it around a bit like that. Mm. Uh, now I'm going to stop and, and flatten it and hope that I can get it over to you so you can see it. Uh, um, there. It's getting there so I can kind of let go and show it to you. But you see, there it is. Uh, you see, it, it, it. we know it's unknotted. But even, even, uh, even from here, if I had just handed it to you, it would be kind of hard for you to understand that it was unknotted. And yet, in this case, you can understand what happened. It had to do with that, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, twisting and twisting again. Um, and if you try to uh, um, intellectually figure out whether it's unknotted, it's a little hard. But maybe I could have a volunteer, because I claim that it will fall apart in anybody's hands if they start playing with it without thinking. So could I have a volunteer for this experiment? You're, okay, uh, uh, sure. Uh, thank you. So, so just just take it and uh, play with it with a mild intent on not. Yeah, you see what I mean. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so you see, this question of unknotting uh, lives in some peculiar levels in terms of our actions in the world. Uh, it may be not so hard for us to unravel something by using the body, but if you tried to figure it out with your mind, uh, you don't have any way to handle it. Yeah? Um, what would happen if you just coated the thing with Teflon and pulled? Does that tell you whether it's knotted? I mean, it's oh, yeah, well, I, I, I understand what you're saying, right. Um, in If we had something... Uh, like this, uh -huh. uh, uh, and um, and and I pulled it up. I pull it up fairly tight, right, right. with some friction. Then, um, if there's enough friction there, it will hold, even though it's not knotted. But if I give it a yank, it will go away. Uh, and if it was coated with Teflon or grease or something like that, then maybe it's reasonable to conjecture that put anything in the rope and have it uh, have it uh, greased up so that there's basically no friction and apply forces end to end, uh, it should come apart. Um, there are other experiments that I like. Uh, I'm tempted to go off and out of the slideshow, but I won't. But I could do it afterwards. But I mean, there will that always answer the question, is it knotted, if you did that? Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, so you're, you're asking me about uh, ways to tell whether something is unknotted. Is that, an, that's a, that sounds like a pretty good physical algorithm to me. I, I'm willing to believe your physical algorithm. That you, you dip the, you put, you, you put the note in, uh, put the knot in, in grease, uh, uh, tie it up, um, and then apply force and see what happens. Why not? And would that also get you prime knots at whatever it is? If you do that, would it reduce to some prime promises? Okay, so, so now you're coming to another uh, extremely good question, right? Uh, I tie, um, I tie some knot, um, and now this one's so simple that you already perceive its least form, uh, but it didn't ha necessarily have to have been given to you in such a form. It might have been, it might have been handed to you in some mess, right? <laughs> and then, and then your um, your hope was that you would grease it up and then you would apply forces to it, and maybe they would reduce it, and maybe they will. Here friction is coming into the play, and uh, it's not reducing much more than that, but I, but I coax it for a while, and it becomes, it uses less and less rope you know, under my coaxing, until finally I find it in the least amount of rope form needed in order to have the knot. And there's another mathematical problem. What's the least amount of rope you need in order to make the knot? It's clear that, um, that if I used less rope than this, I wouldn't be able to manage to tie it at all, given a, for a given diameter. So that's a, an honest problem. Uh, every knot uh, requires a certain amount of rope. More complicated ones require more rope. Simpler ones require less. There are certainly, you can even play some games to see some more complicated ones very easily, like somebody like this, uh, somebody like this obviously needs a lot more rope than, um, than the Treflon knot. 
but how much more um, could we manipulate this and get it to use less? But obviously, a good deal more than the trough will not. So how much rope? So I'll measure the amount of rope by taking the length of the rope divided by the diameter. So, uh, and then try to minimize that. Uh, and people have done this with, the, with computers, so they have tables of them. Uh, but no one has the exact answer for any knot, including the trefoil knot. No one knows the exact length to diameter ratio for making a trefoil knot. That's an unsolved problem. Uh, that's kind of amazing, you would think, because the, the theory of people have been studying knots for quite a while, um, since the 1800s. Um, uh, but nevertheless, I mean, people have been studying knots longer than that, uh, non-mathematically, but mathematically since the middle 1800s. So that's an unsolved problem, the rope length problem. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, you know why they come untied. Uh, maybe your question is, um, what's a better way to tie my shoelaces? And, um, and I, must, I must tell you, as long as you brought it up, that I, I, I learned a better method from, from a little book that, uh, there are a lot of popular books on knots that are actually about real knot tying. And there's one uh, which probably is in its uh, 100th edition by now, but some years ago. It was called the Klutz Book of Knots. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, they explained, uh, ah, I, I don't remember, I'm sorry, you'll excuse me, this is uh, crude, but uh, I'll, I'll demonstrate for you because I don't remember what it is that I do. But I learned this from that book. You, you know, you cross over the, uh, the, uh, this, and then you bring up uh, you bring up a loop, and then I had learned as a child to go around the loop once. But if you go around twice and then pull it through to form the other loop, and tighten just twice, yeah, right. just twice rather than once, and break your microphone. I think we're okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, let's not get too technical about this one, but that, I, I, I did it by checking how I do it. Um, and you just go around twice and then bring it through, uh, and that makes a, a much more stable um, uh, shoelace. But, but, but what, you're, what you're talking about, what we're talking about at the moment are aspects of knotting which are um, not easy to analyze mathematically because they use a lot of physical properties of the knot uh, that are, sorry, uh, that are all to happening all together, friction and the topology and so on. So that uh, <coughs> um, even very simple uh, things uh, are very interesting to examine. So for example, you have two pieces of rope. This, is, this goes way back thousands of years. People have been inventing ways to splice two pieces of rope. And one of the simplest ones is the square knot splice, like that, right? And why does that work well, rather than why doesn't it work well? Uh, but this one works very well, and, and if you try it out and pull on it, it tightens nicely, and if there's any friction on the rope at all, it's good and it will hold. And you can see why it works, in that each of the loops, the red loop, grabs the, the base of the blue, and the blue loop grabs the base of the red loop, and each grabbing the other and pulling on it, uh, it, it uh, it's cybernetic. It forms a, 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 a mutual system between those two that holds. Uh, and if there's any friction at all, it will work. On the other hand, if you, if you do the opposite twist here, which is sometimes called the granny, and I've been po it's been pointed out to me that that is not very politically correct. Um, <laughs> but if you do that with the opposite twist, uh, then you do not have this situation where each one is tightening the base of the other. And if you give um, an impulse to this, it can come apart. In this case, it didn't. It just tightened, but it can come apart. Uh, and it could be perilous if you uh, tried to join ropes like this when you were climbing. Uh, you shouldn't do it. Um, 
and and uh, and then there are other there are a lot of devices. So we got into talking about these devices, but take the um, um, bowline. The bowline is a well-known example of a good method of doing a certain thing. You you form a loop and then you put uh, put the rope up through the loop and back around and down through the loop, and you end up with this with an extra loop here. Now this extra loop has one specific length, the way I did it. I can make it longer or shorter by putting this elsewhere, but it has a specific length, and, it, and it's tightened nicely for that length. The length could be around my waist, and I'm, I'm belaying down a, down a, a cliff. Um, and, uh, and it won't over-tighten and, and strangle my waist. It just will be that exact length that I set it up to be. Um, and on the other hand, suppose I need to get out of it for some reason. Well, it's very easy. You just flip this back, and it comes apart. So that's a nice example of an invention. And there are many inventions of this kind, if you read a book on knot tying, that have, that have been evolved over the years. And a lot of those inventions involve this interrelationship between friction and the physical states of the knot and the topological properties of the knot, which means just its flexibility and shape. So, um, but, but someone was asking a few moments ago, well, what about telling whether you were asking whether we could tell how to, uh, whether we could actually have an algorithm to unknot a knot if it was unknotted. Um, and, uh, and a physical algorithm was suggested. And there are some other physical algorithms that are suggested as well that go like this. And if we had a little time afterwards, I would show you something on the computer. Physical algorithm goes like this. You, you have the knot in the computer space, and you make it a self-repelling knot. You coat it with electrical charge. Mm. Now it, uh, but you keep the length the same. So then it tries to push away from itself. Uh, and if it's unknotted, it tends to just push away from itself and become one nice long circle. So it looks like that algorithm is correct. Uh, but becomes harder and harder to handle com computationally when you have l larger knots. Uh, uh, so that's a, another possible semi-physical algorithm. And then um, something that I hadn't intended to talk about at all, but it's, it's such an intriguing one that I can't resist digressing into it and showing it to you. Um, let me see if I can draw something on the board. Um, that will illustrate it. Um, if you use diagrams, then you can try to unknot the knot. Oh, thank you. That's good. Um, you could, I'm drawing something which I hope is unknotted. <laughs> now, I can, I can represent my knots by diagrams of this kind. Um, here's the trefoil knot again. Uh, it is a projection of what happened in three-dimensional space. <coughs> you just imagine the rope has been abstracted to a, to a line, a mathematical line or curve, and you project it into the plane, and you keep track of whether it's over or under by drawing it over or under, where over means it's nearer to you, and the under is farther away to your eye. Okay? Um, now, what about this? Is this on knotted or knotted? Well, you can see how to undo it by just looking at the picture, right? You can do it on the picture. So, for example, you can say, all right, I will pull this in a little bit um, to here. And I've gotten it a little more unknotted. And then you see, well, I can untwist it here. And, and now I can pull it in a little bit more. And now, uh, now a couple of untwistings, and it's unknotted. So it, it was never knotted much. It wasn't, it wasn't in a difficult knot. But I could give you a more difficult one.
Sí. Uh, some mistake got made there. Uh, sí. Under, over. Mistake. I'm sorry. Uh, well, let me just give me. Let me get this back. Uh, all right. Under. Over. Under. Over. Under. There's no under there. No. Okay. There. Now, <laughs> sorry uh, for the delay, but. Um, I claim this is unknotted. Um, let's draw another, while you think about that, let me draw another picture of it. So we can manipulate. That's a, a copy, I hope. Yeah? All right, so I'm looking for a strategy to unknot it, and I notice that I can pull this line, this one that I'm looking at right now, I can slide it off to the right. It's under everything, so I can just push it off to the right. And if I do that, end up here. And now maybe you see that the rest of it is going to be relatively easy because this goes out and back through here so I can pull it in. I can pull this part in. Here. And now you see it goes under, under there, and pulls in, and it's gone. So the, so the way in which it became unknotted was by moving this line underneath all the way out and then bringing it back through and, and so on. Yeah. It gets unknotted. Yeah. Well, surely that's true, right? Um, I mean, if you gave, if I, I, you said, all right, you give me some, uh, some here's some thing, and, and that, that knottedness is built into this from the beginning. The fact that it truly is knotted means that, uh, and it's built in from the very beginning, means that if I were to take a blackboard picture of this and start manipulating it, which is no more or less than, uh, than this, right? This guy. Now I can I can push this around on the blackboard. Right. I just wanted to follow what you your idea. You're you're saying well you push this around on the blackboard, and maybe uh, it ends up looking like that after a moment or two, or maybe I twist this, um, and maybe I take this and I slide it all the way up here, um, and and so on, and I'm getting a more complicated picture on my blackboard than this, just like I could get a more complicated rope up, uh, picture by manipulating this, but uh, all that's true. And then? Well, it's not changing it from being knotted to unknotted. That can change it from, being, from the very beginning of drawing. And I think that if you go to trade and change your kids, that that's what you're, you're doing. I think I'm 
Um, hmm. I'm, I'm not quite sure uh, what we're talking about, but let's let's look again. Um, uh, suppose that this was what I prepared for you, right? Like the one on the blackboard, only I'm doing it in three dimensions. And I prepared this, right? Now, it isn't knotted. Uh, of course, it has some knotting in it, but it's not knotted. So it might be a matter of language. Uh, anybody who received this would say they had received a knotted object, but it isn't a knotted object from our point of view because it's possible to smoothly, without cutting or, or, or otherwise disturbing it, turn it into something which is unknotted, right? Uh, and what I just did in space, I could well do on a blackboard. Yeah, I mean, it might look like it's knotted, but it isn't knotted. All right. So, uh, so are we on the same page? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> A little cold here going. So this this fellow was unknotted, um, and uh, and it looked like I had a strategy there. The strategy was to draw a diagram of the knot and then look for uh, these kind of swing moves that would manage to um, undo it if they were if they were available. The swing move I'm looking for is something that goes under everybody or in between everybody. And if I did the move, uh, uh, why I could get less crossings, right? That's what happened. I took this and I pushed it out and I ended up with these three crossings disappearing, so it got smaller. And so for a long time, people were looking for algorithms of that kind. Oh, thank you very much. People were looking for algorithms of that kind. Um, and it was very hard, and no one found one until around mm, 2001 or so. And then a man named Ivan Dinikov Dinikov, Dinikov found exactly an algorithm that will, uh, will enable you to keep searching on a diagram and find out how to unknot a knot. And, and I want to show you his algorithm. I, it didn't occur to me to do this in the talk, so we're taking up quite a lot of talk time, but, but his algorithm is, uh, is as follows. I'm going to draw you the kind of picture that he draws. He doesn't draw this kind of picture but it's related to it. He draws this kind of picture where all the lines are horizontal or vertical, all right? Like that, kind of a Mondrian version of the knot. Um, and then all the vertical lines in the diagram are over. So that means that for him, he doesn't even have to do this because he's used to it. Uh, for him, when he draws a diagram like the one I just drew, that was it. That was, that was whatever it was, knotted or not. But for, for us mortals, uh, we'll put in that it's over. And uh, then it's still the same information, just emphasized. And it's not uh, actually very hard to prove that any diagram that I draw in this kind of form can be manipulated a little bit until it's topologically one of these nice straight Mondrian diagrams like that. Dinikov diagram. And then he counts the complexity of it by counting how many vertical lines there are in the diagram. Right? And then you try to stay in this category of diagrams by making some sliding moves uh, that are correct topologically um, and simplify at the same time. Now in this case, it does look to me like I've drawn something that is knotted. Um, so, uh, so it won't be obvious from this one uh, how to unknot it. But let me draw another example.
Okay, so that one is this one, right? Everybody's vertically over. And in this one, you see that you can stay in the category of these rectilinear diagrams by just shifting this up a little bit, right? If you just shift that up a little bit, it'll stay in category. It will look, it will, or you could, sorry, I don't want to do two things at once. Um, we could go there. That's just pushing it up a little bit, okay? And you're in the, you stay in the category. You, you're, only, you're only allowed to make moves on these that keep you in the category and are still topologically the same. Now, because we don't have a lot of time in this talk, I don't want to formalize what the moves are, but you just saw one of them, like that. And, and you, will, you will invent all the rest of them if you followed my dictum of looking for moves that's, that keep these things good. Um, except I don't think I drew the... No, I did. All right, I just pushed that up. Right. But now, what about the next thing you should be able to do? Here you have this... Um, you have this guy here, uh, and um, and you should be able to remove him, right? You should be able to remove somebody like this at a corner, uh, like that. And so you're allowed, you're allowed to do that. And now you're down to here. And then you should be allowed to shift something in a little bit if it's not if or or you could put it another way. Lots of different ways to put the rule. Um, if you see something like this, you should be allowed to straighten the corner. So let's say that that's what we just did. We straightened the corner. And now we're down to the unknown, you see. Now, that's the way the algorithm works. And um, you can try it out yourself. Draw some pictures like that. And uh, some of them will turn out to be unknotted. And you will find that when they are unknotted, you can manage to get them unknotted by shifting the diagram around like that. And you never make it more complicated. You never make the number of vertical lines bigger. So it means that you're searching in a finite number of things. And so he proved that there's a simple combinatorial algorithm, this one, which allows you to search among a large but finite number of, uh, of images and find out whether something is knotted or unknotted. So the diagrams actually succeed in that way. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, that you went from a curved Nessie diagram to one of the Hanzian diagrams. Is that hard? No, not a, not hard. Um, let's. Why don't we try to do it for something? Well, uh, yeah, but but um, but let's take a look at what it what it is essentially going to be like. Um, you, you want to set up the diagram so that, um, uh, so that uh, it looks like it has some maxima and some minima, and the crossing should be, uh, should be adjusted so that they look like this, you see? So you can do this by, and then what you're going to do once you have the maxima and the minima is you're going to straighten them out and make them rectilinear. So in this case, um, I'm just going to um, uh, make a drawing, and you'll get the idea. Um, sorry. So. So I took this, this diagram here and I just made it a little more maxima, minima, maxima, and some crossings in the middle, like that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, then, uh, and then I can make this uh, more rectilinear, but, um, but I should, uh, before I do that, twist these a little bit uh, so that they, uh, uh, they look um, like this. You see. So it's, it's, it's funny 
I mean, I think you get the picture, right? I can be more careful about these things and, and, and make it all systematic, but that's the idea. As a function of the number of doctors, does the time, that's still a function of the time that it takes to... The time that it takes yeah, to, to convert one diagram to another? To solve the diagram. Oh, 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 you mean if... Um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, what you're asking is how complex is it to unknot and unknot? <laughs> right? And in other words, how big is the space in which we are searching? when we do this kind of search. How big is it? And, um, and you, can, you can get a, a feel for this by, by thinking in terms of the number of vertical bars that I was telling you about before. Because what re this really means is you see that it's got four vertical bars and it's got four horizontal bars. And now I've gone and made the picture a little bit of a mess, but, but what's happening is happening in a four by four array, right? Our knot which I almost made invisible to myself. There it is. Um, it's living in a four by four array. So the key number is four, uh, but the complexity involved, the thing that you're searching among is basically four factorial squared things if you start to analyze what it is that's going on. So you're searching in a, you're searching in a junk shop of four factorial squared things or n factorial squared things. As the, as the knot gets larger, the search gets very large. But, um, but if you want to do a computer algorithm to unknot a knot, you can do it. You just tell the computer to try to do these, uh, find these slide moves and um, look around, and after a while, it will unknot it if it's unknotted. Okay? Um, maybe I should continue my slideshow a little bit, and maybe we're... Uh, <laughs> We have a few minutes. Let's see what I can do. Um, there were all sorts of nice things here we didn't talk about. Um, one of them was the belt trick. Does that look familiar, what you just saw? What's it called? It's called the belt trick. The belt trick. Yes. Um, let me... Uh, leave that up and explain to you what it, what it is. This isn't about knotting, it's about twisting in relation to, to your environment. And I, I was going to use a belt, but, uh, uh, but I think maybe these uh, strands of rope will do just as well. So um, what I would like you to do, if you could, is to hold on to the end of that and maybe stand up next to me so we can, thank you, so we, that everybody can see the belt. Now, um, if I put a, just hold on, uh, if I put a 360 degree twist in this belt, that's uh, 180, and this is 360, okay. Now, uh, now, the idea is this, that he's out at a wall next, and the belt is attached to him, and here is a ball hanging in space to which the belt is attached. All right. But I wish to think of this as a ball suspended in space so there's no arm attached to it. So if you can imagine that the arm disappears and the hand is still hanging in midair, <laughs> uh, uh, then I can produce the effect of that by bringing it around. And now I want it to go through the non-existent arm. And so what I do is I exchange hands and it went around the hand, that uh, the arm that wasn't there. And as you see, the it's still twisted by 360 degrees. And if we went back the other way, it would still be twisted by 360 degrees. 
But if you twist by 720 degrees, not just two more twists like this, so now it's twisted up by 720 degrees, and then we brought the twisted belt around the ball in the middle of the space and pulled back, it's gone. <laughs> right? so, um, so for some strange reason, 720 degrees of twist is the same as no twist at all. And you can try this by going back and so on, or let me just do it forward again. I twist by one, two, three, four, and then come back around like this. And whoops, what happened? Well, I doubled it. I doubled it. I went around in the wrong direction. But if I went around in the other direction, uh, why then it would be gone. So uh, thank you. That's good. Now, <coughs> what uh, this this um, this is illustrated in many other uh, ways. Like um, uh, I could have tried the the glass of water, but it's better not. I have an object in my hand, um, and uh, maybe you've done this before. You you I'm turning right. So. How much am I turning? How much is my hand turning? I'm keeping it flat. By the time I get down here, it's turned by 360 degrees. And then I keep on going. And by the time I get back to where I started, 720 degrees, but no, no twist in my arm. I'm back to where I started. All right? So this is the same situation. Now, why is this happening? Uh, well, it's easy to understand why it's happening. But the fact is, that the fact that it's related to certain other things is maybe quite interesting. We can go back to the puzzle of why did that work. But, um, but what it's related to is the following, that um, if I were uh, an observer and that was an electron, and I move continuously around the electron and come back to where I started, and I'm doing quantum mechanics, uh, then I have to put a, ni a negative sign in the wave function that I'm working with. I have to change the sign of the wave function. The state of the electron relative to me has, has switched. And if I go around twice, it comes back to normal. Fermions have that property, that there is an orientation entanglement relation with the space in which you're in. And it's as though the fermion were attached to me by a belt like that. So um, um, the, the reasons why that is related to quantum mechanics are beyond the scope of a talk which is over in one minute. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 I won't try to explain that. But the topology of it is very visual. Uh, the topology of the bell trick is very visualizable. This is what you were seeing. But this doesn't quite, uh, this doesn't quite explain it, does it? So maybe we should use the blackboard for a moment again. Can we have the light? Um, um, and then I'll show you a movie about some of the properties of it. But, um, but here's the situation that we were looking at. We had, uh, he was holding it back here. Here's the belt. And here's the ball hanging in space. And we put in, um, we put in 360 degrees of twist in the belt. And then we put 360 degrees of twist in the belt again. And we're sitting down here, right? And then uh, and then the belt got coaxed around the ball and back, and somehow it all got canceled out. So you can draw a picture of this if you're careful. Um, and the picture it tells all, really. Um, and you can also, of course, do this with the belt. You can make this same image that I'm creating here um, with chalk in reality. <coughs> Let me erase that a little bit. A 360-degree twist in a belt is the same as a little curling twist like that, if you relax it, right? We could demonstrate that with the strands easily enough. Uh, even with one strand on one string, right? Um, if I have a little curl like this in a, in a rope and I pull on it, then you see that 
it causes a twist in the rope when I pull it straight. Yeah. So the twist in the rope and the curl in the rope are interchangeable. But now this is now you can see what happens if I pull it, pull it down. Pull it down like that, still anchored here, and then I bring it back underneath. So I bring it down over the front and back, and then push it back a little bit and bring it back underneath. Yeah? And then, what's the last thing? The last thing is, of course, to straighten it again. But now this is the opposite curl. This one went that, this one went over and then under, and this one goes under and then over. And so, when you, um, when you um, do this, it's going to end up giving you the opposite twist. And now you have twist and opposite twist, and they cancel each other out. Yeah? I'm sorry? Uh, yeah, Dirac. Dirac is well known for Dirac is well known for having used this trick to illustrate the properties of a fermion. That's okay. correct. I see. Thank um, you. And um, and he is the uh, discoverer of a whole lot of things. Yeah. Okay. So so you see that uh, topologically you can understand what happened there very nicely. So um, so what that's one of the things you want to be able to do with concrete topology is to actually understand in a, in a direct physical way why certain things work as well as why they might not work. Um, so there is a little film here that we made years ago that illustrates some of these things, and I thought I would show that to you, and then we'll see. I, think, I guess we can go until 7.30 with no trouble, right? Yeah. So um, in this film, we, we created a, visual, a computer graphic visualization of some of these uh, ideas with an outer sphere on which the belts are attached and some inner ball on which the belts are attached and then the things can. Now this is like uh, this, you see. Uh, it's going round and round and it goes under and then it goes up and it isn't getting twisted at all in the end. It just gets a certain amount of twist and then the opposite twist. I'm told there are certain kinds of blood centrifuges that uh, work on this principle so that uh, something can be kept spinning at high speed um, and, uh, and not have the cables get entangled. There is a, a Philippine wine dance based on these movements um, and also some movements in Chinese martial arts that are related to this. We did, oh, okay. And here is the, see, totally untwisted, goes around the inner sphere and comes back 720. And you can make it as complicated as you like because it's just these uh, rotations of space on itself that are making this happen. And so uh, it could be anything very complicated, twisting and untwisting in this way. So there's more to say about this, uh, uh, this phenomenon, but that's, that's the Dirac string trick. And Let me see if there was something else I wanted to say about it. Mm -hmm. 
Maybe not. Let's go on. <laughs> um, so I'm shifting, a to I'm shifting to another topic. Um, uh, here is um, a book written in 1900, published in 1900 by Romilly Allen, which was shown to me by a statistical physicist named David Evans a, a long time ago. <coughs> and um, you see here um, some Celtic knot patterning over here on the left. And Romilly Allen's theory about how to do Celtic knot design, uh, which is actually a, a very popular way of thinking about Celtic knot design, but maybe Romilly Allen was the first person to present this notion. He said, the way you should think of these as being made and the way people actually made them, he believed, was that you started with, um, you started with a regular pattern like this, and then you took some of these crossings uh, and you smoothed them out. You could replace them by either connecting this to this or that to that. And then you would produce sub-patterns of this of various kinds. And, uh, and just to show you for a moment uh, the systematic nature of such a thing, here is one of these uh, that's available on the web. Um, and you can uh, you can make designs with this. You see, <laughs> you do that, or you do that, or you do that, and it brings you back to exactly the same crossing. You might think, I, I wondered why the designer of this program didn't also allow you to switch the crossing, but but Celtic knots are usually alternating, so maybe there's a good reason. Um, anyway, uh, you see, I cut out a little Celtic knot there, and you can play with this and make patterns. Uh, as you like. And so on. So, um, so, uh, so there's a huge combinatorial complexity of all of the different things that you could make from a given knot pattern by, by changing the crossings, either by smoothing them one way or smoothing them another way. Um, and this is um, in integral to, to the design of, uh, of various forms of knotting. But it turned out, but, um, but mathematicians like myself were a little late to understand such matters. Uh, it turned out uh, that you could, um, you could do this and, uh, and get a lot of mathematical uh, information from the very same thing. Uh, and the mathematical thing that you needed to do was to add things together rather than uh, just uh, make them two things different, you see. So here's an equation. The equation says that some polynomial associated with the knot on the left, which happens to have that crossing, um, is going to be equal to A, some algebra element, times a polynomial associated with the knot or link obtained by smoothing it this way, and another polynomial uh, uh, obtained by smoothing it the other way. So you just look at the two different uh, the two different kinds of knots that can be obtained by smoothing it one way or the other and adding up uh, the results. Now then then it becomes an algebra matter. Then you then you have to say well what would happen then? Uh, I would like this I would like this result that I get to not depend on the topology. Uh, if I were to move the move the knot around and do this on some other version of the knot, I would like to get the same result, the same polynomial. And, uh, and that requires some analysis of the mathematics to see what, uh, what adjustment of these variables, A and B, will make it actually independent of what knot you started with. So you're going to end up with some polynomial or a number, if A and B were numbers, um, and you want the number to not change when you move the knot around. So then you end up with uh, things on your blackboard that look like this, calculations involving, uh, involving these things and, and, some, um, and some careful theorizing to make sure that the uh, variables and everything are adjusted in such a way that you will get the same results. So in this case, what I'm calculating here is that I get a polynomial like uh, like that for the mirror image of the trefoil 
and I get a different, I get a polynomial um, like that uh, for the trefoil itself. And you see these two polynomials happen to be different. Um, in one case, I have a to the minus 4. In the other case, I have a to the 4. There's a, a negative sign in the exponents here. They're not the same. They're flipped one from the other. And that flipping one from the other is reflecting how the trefoil and its mirror image are flipped one from another. And the calculations actually end up proving that the trefoil knot can't be turned into its mirror image. Uh, and this turned out, this kind of thing turned out to be um, a, a, a revolution of a sort in knot theory in that one could, one could calculate in a very direct way a lot of properties of knots by just sort of turning them into algebra directly. Um, and the idea goes all the way back to Romilly Allen and, uh, and other, uh, other people who were, who were understanding the sort of remarkable interrelationship between all the knots that are related to one another by changing them slightly locally. That, that's what's going on there. Um, and um, and uh, so I want to talk about this for a little bit more. Um, what, what happens is you see you start with the knot, and then you have all these different ways of smoothing it. You could do this at a crossing or that at a crossing. And you keep on going, and you would get all these funny configurations of circles and relationships which show all the different ways that it could have happened. And this is like just a small piece of the chart in the Celtic knot design device, right? Um, and then we're adding them all up in the right way in order to get an, uh, a mathematical answer. And then um, some years later, that we're talking about middle 80s in that slide, some years later, around 1998, Mikhail Kovanov, who's one of the organizers of this program that, uh, out of which this talk is coming, he understood something very deep about these that is very simple, and that is that you could order them. Um, you see, um, when, you, when you smooth it and it's a crossing, you can talk about one smoothing versus the other as, uh, instead of just talking about them both uh, individually. Maybe, maybe I just go back uh, here. Uh, that'll do. Um, you see, um, there's a crossing here. And because there's a crossing, I can discriminate between these guys called A's and these guys called B's. The guys called A's are obtained by rotating this overcrossing line counterclockwise, and it sweeps out the A's. So the, the smoothing that contains the A's is different from the smoothing that contains the B's. It's, an, it's, a, it's a basic distinction that arises out of the fact that there's a crossing. And so you can think of the one that's smoothed in the A way as being ordered, say, earlier than the one that's smoothed in the B way. And there's an ordering. Now, uh, it's hard to understand why, uh, why uh, holding on to some basic bit of ordering that might be in a situation would be significant. And sometimes it is, and sometimes it isn't. But in this case, it turned out to be. Um, you see, here's the one with all the A's, and then it's ordered, it's earlier than the ones that begin to have B's, and eventually the latest one is the one that has all the B's, and there's this ordering structure that goes from one to the other. And, um, and a, a structure of arrows with, order, uh, with, um, with locations in it like that is called a category, and, and so what happens is that there's enough structure there so that you could ask some questions. You could say, here's the knot. But instead of the knot, I'm going to think of this combinatorial structure here, this, this cube of, of patterns. And I can ask, what would happen to that cube of patterns when I move the knot around? How can I measure that? Um, and, uh, and then certain techniques for measuring that Lead to new, led to entirely new invariants and a lot of connections with many interesting things. So, um, so that that uh, is uh, an example of something that happened. Now, another thing that happened, and this was earlier, was uh, uh, the other relationships with statistical mechanics. But we're almost out of time, and I wanted to show you a couple more things that would require less talk. So, if you don't mind. 
am going to flick through a few slides without commenting on them. And we did the knot tricks, and we've talked enough about the truffle knot. <laughs> so I arrive after skipping through something. I, I can't resist mentioning something about what I skipped through. Uh, it has to do with geometry. Um, are you aware of the following uh, situation? Um, that the basic notion in differential geometry is the notion of translating a vector parallel to itself, all right, uh, along some curved surface or curved space, all right, and measuring what happens to it, watching what happens to it. Um, so, if, for example, if I'm on the surface of a globe and my uh, and my my uh, my hand is on the surface of the globe that I can create by moving my arm around. Um, well, then I can parallel translate my the vector, which consists in my thumb, uh, over here by 90 degrees. And then I can parallel translate it up to the North Pole. And then, remember, parallel translate means you don't see it wobbling, right? It's, it's keeping in the same direction. And then I'm parallel translating down the longitude line back to where I started. But it turned by 90 degrees. You know, watch that again if you haven't seen it before, right? Turn, parallel translate, parallel translate, parallel translate, turn by 90 degrees. So that total turn is, is a measure of the fact that the surface of the Earth is curved. If it had been flat, just flat surface and I'm moving my thumb around on it, I come back to exactly where I started. It's the curvature of the Earth that made this turn by 90 degrees when I went around the tri large triangle. So, um, so that idea in relation to understanding how to measure knots was taken up by the physicist Witten in the late 1980s using uh, what they call, what physicists call, gauge theory. But gauge theory is a form of differential geometry, and the basic idea of, of that was that you would have the knot in space, and there is this field which defines a parallel translation in a certain sense. And you walk a particle along the knot, all the way around the knot, just like I was walking this particle around the surface of the sphere, uh, until it comes back to where it starts. And then you measure how the particle got changed in that field. And it gives you a measure of the knot. But it depends on certain kinds of curvature. So it isn't an invariant of the knot. If you were to move it around a tiny loop, it would be measuring the curvature of the field. It would be measuring, it would be measuring something physical. And it has to be averaged out. And so Witten's idea was that you, f you measure this polynomy of, of, the knot, of the particle around the knot, and then you average over all the different gauge fields, and you end up with a knot invariant. And, and indeed, you do. Um, you end up with lots and lots of different knot invariants depending on the field. And among them is the one that I was showing you that came from the Celtic idea of, of, of smoothing this way and smoothing that way and many others. So, it has, so those things are all interrelated with physics and geometric ideas and so on. What are you looking at here? DNA. DNA. Um, and this is an experiment due to Cazzarelli, Spengler, and Stasiak in the middle 1980s in which they pioneered the uh, idea that they could coat DNA with protein in such a way to make it thick and fuzzy so that it could be seen in an electron microscope whether it wove over or under itself. And then they could create these uh, diagrams via electron microscopy of knots, of DNA knots. And um, it, it is agreed that this is over and that's under and this is over and that's under and, and so on. And there might be a little bit of worry over here, but that's over and under and so on. And 
uh, so you know what knot you got, not from every photograph, but from uh, a large number of them. And then you could try to figure out what knot did you actually get, and you might have to rotate it around and then compare it with the elements in the table. And this one turns out to be 6-2 here. 6-2, oh, sorry, so this one, I mean. Sorry, this one. No? Yeah, this one. What is the subscripts? Oh, the subscripts are meaningless. They, the tables were built a long time ago, and when they were built, the person said, this is the first one, and that's the second one. <laughs> the six means six crossings. So, um, so then knot theory uh, became something that was important for thinking about in terms of molecular biology. Here's another way in which these electron micrographs were used. You see, suppose you started with a DNA like this, and it underwent a recombination here. Now, re this one's unknotted, but recombination means that uh, it's broken and recombined like this. See, there's an enzyme which breaks this and then connects this to this and that to that. Um, but is it twisting over or twisting under? If it were twisting over and consistently twisting over and doing recombination again and again like this, then you would see a series of knots and links coming out. And so you can go to the electron microscope, set the processive uh, recombination experiment going, and look at the products and see whether you indeed have a lot of unknots, hop links, figure eight knots, whitehead links, and maybe a few other things. Um, and in the case of the situation that they started with, that's what they saw. And so that was good scientific proof that it was twisting over when it was recombining. And this kind of research continues. I think we're nearing the end, but I, I wanted to see if I could select some other point that would be of interest to you. Um, oh, I, yeah. Uh, Oh, well, I can't resist this one because um, uh, it's funny. This is the uh, Wikipedia, uh, history of Wikipedia about knot theory. And, <coughs> and, and it is explained in here how uh, Lord Kelvin um, had a theory, that's Sir William Thompson, he had a theory in the 1800s that, um, uh, that uh, uh, knotted vortices in the luminiferous ether were going to be atoms. Uh, and this was a very uh, uh, strongly uh, researched theory in, at those times. Uh, but then slowly, as we moved into the 20th century, the ether disappeared. <laughs> and, so, and, so, and so you have a statement in this history that goes like this. When the luminiferous ether was not detected in the Michelson-Morley experiment, the vortex theory, that's Kelvin's vortex theory, became completely obsolete and knot theory ceased to be of great scientific interest. <laughs> um, so somebody needs to revise that history. Um, um, among other things, people discovered vortices and uh, actually discovered vortices, really made them um, vortices in water. And the lab that did that is and people that did that are William Irvine and Dustin Kleckner, his student, and they were able to create knotted vortices in water. Now, to understand the difficulty of this problem, try to imagine blowing a knotted smoke ring. <laughs> um, you could think of some strategies, but nobody has ever managed to actually blow a knotted smoke ring. Um, and, uh, and they got the idea that the right way to do it would be to use a template that was knotted and, um, and do the smoke ring thing nonetheless. The smoke ring thing is you have a template with a hole in it and you pull it back quickly through the liquid and vortexing occurs along the lip and, um, and a, a vortex goes forward, uh, 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 a line vortex. Uh, so why not have a knotted uh, template and then the line vortex would be knotted for a little while. Sounds like cheating, but on the other hand, you could make it really happen, and that's interesting. And that's what they did, and they used 3D printing, 3D printing in order to uh, make those templates and tinker with them. So here is their movie of a non-knotted vortex by that method. And it 
high speed photography. <coughs> they tend to break up <coughs> very quickly. And here's the movie of the knotted vortex. And again, the high speed photography, very impressive because now you can limpidly see that there really is a knotted 3D truffle knotted vortex there. So I'll stop at that point. Okay, so um, can you talk about why the trefoil uh, knot is unsolved in terms of the length to the diameter? Because if I picture either with a physical knot or modeling on a computer, I could measure the lengths and diameters. Well, it's because it's one thing, it's one thing to, um, to measure an actual object. I can tie a trefoil knot here and I can pull this up tight and, oh, but what happened? I, I'm, I'm, I have a, a variational problem involving geometry that's varying, right? The, 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 confi the geometrical configuration of the knot. I felt it just now. I mean, I, you could try it yourself. You will feel that something oh, sort of locks in as it comes in and fits into itself. But how do I, how do I solve that variational problem? I need to solve not for a number, but for a geometrical configuration, the right one, the least one. So it isn't easy to find that. It's a, it's a kind of calculus of variations that we don't know how to do. So that's the best I can say. All right, well, let's thank Lou one more time, and I'm sure he'll take more questions.